In this video, I'm going to look at fisheye photography, a style of photography that can be a lot of fun with loads of creative opportunities. And I'll be reviewing a highly regarded film era fisheye lens, the Takuma 17 f4, to see how well it performs on digital cameras and up against modern digital lenses on full frame and crop sensors. The history of fisheye photography dates back to the start of the 1900s. This is the first recorded fisheye image, taken in 1905, from the bottom of a pail of water. Inventors subsequently designed glass lenses that had a 180 degree field of view, and over the years manufacturers have sold a wide variety of fisheye lenses to professional and amateur photographers. The iconic fisheye view probably looks like this, the circular image. And perhaps the most iconic fisheye lens, and the most expensive, is this one, the Nikkor 6mm f2.8, with a 220 degree field of view. More conventional fisheye images have straight rather than circular borders, but the image is still distorted by the fisheye effect, and these are the kind of images I'll be covering. You don't actually need to buy a fisheye lens to create a fisheye look. You can do this using software. And not all ultra-wide-angle lenses are fisheye lenses. You can buy ultra-wide-angle rectilinear lenses that optically correct distortion. This correction can also be made to distorted fisheye images using software, including straightening out the vertical lines or straightening out the horizontal lines, although the corrections don't always look very natural. If you're bored with your conventional lenses, then it's well worth trying a real fisheye lens. There's a lot of fun to be had taking fisheye photos and playing with the way buildings, horizons, people and other subjects can be curved or distorted. However, it's fair to say that not everyone is so keen. In my own family, opinion is very much divided, with fisheye images sometimes seen as odd or cliched. And some people prefer images from fisheye lenses that don't actually look like they've been taken with a fisheye at all. They look like they've been taken with an ultra-wide lens with limited distortion. And the way a fisheye lens distorts a person's face up close, this kind of effect is becoming easier to produce on smartphone cameras, with all the hardware and photo processing apps available. Fisheye images don't always have to look completely distorted, and there are a number of other creative ways to use these lenses. You can get close up to subjects without going for a totally distorted look. You can capture a lot of foreground and background details from an unusual point of view, for example by taking photos from the ground up, or you can use the 180 degree perspective to take this kind of image, something that would be harder to produce using an ultra wide lens. And there are loads of other examples of the creative use of fisheyes online. So now let's move on to a review of one of the higher rated film era fisheye lenses, the Takuma 17 F4. The Takuma is one of a number of fisheye lenses made by different manufacturers during the film era. It's an M42 screw mount lens and it's easy to adapt to my camera gear, but you'll have to check whether it can adapt to your camera properly. My particular lens is the super multi-coated version. There's also an earlier version without the multi-coatings. And my understanding is that the coatings do help to produce more contrasty and possibly more colorful images with better control of light leaks. So this version is the more desirable and it tends to be more expensive. The lens was made in Japan between 1973 and 1976. It was one of four screw mount fisheye Takuma lenses. Asahi Optical, who owned Pentax and Takuma, had introduced the first diagonal fisheye in 1962. This was designed to capture approximately a 180 degree field of view across the diagonal of the 35mm film frame. Initially the lenses were fixed focus and slow, but in 1967 Takuma launched the F4 version with a variable focus, and then the super multi-coated version. If you own one of these lenses, you'll find that its six aperture blades feature quite prominently on occasions because the lens can produce very clear hexagons. It has a minimum focal distance of less than 20 centimeters, which means you can get really close to objects. There's no support for hoods or external filters, so you have to be careful not to get too close and scratch the front element. In terms of the lens's ergonomics, it's small and light, weighing only around 228 grams. It's beautifully made, and the focus and other rings are very smooth, but their small size makes the controls a little fiddly. I'm much happier leaving the lens at infinity, rather than trying to focus on closer-up objects. Even with in-camera focus aids, I'm never quite sure I'm nailing the focus close up. Because there's no hood, I do very occasionally use my hand to shield the lens from the sun, but you have to be careful not to include your fingers in the photo. 
The lens has 11 elements in 7 groups, and it wasn't cheap to make or buy. I'll talk about the price of these lenses towards the end of the video. It has three built-in filters, a neutral UV type filter, a red filter, and a yellow filter. Here are three photos of the same subject, taken with the different filters. The yellow and red filters are designed to help specifically with the rendering of black and white images. And I have to say up front, this lens is a real star performer for black and white images. The yellow filter absorbs blue, so it helps to produce greater contrast between blue and yellow or white subjects. So it's useful for shooting black and white scenes, which include portions of a cloud-filled sky. I don't use this filter a great deal, as I find the red filter much more interesting and dramatic. I actually use the red filter quite a lot, more than I thought I would before I got the lens. The red filter gives black and white images very strong contrasts. If you're taking photos on a cloudy day or a partly cloudy day, the filter helps to give a real depth, not just to the clouds, but also to the whole image. And the red filter works well even if you point the lens straight at the sun. To give you an example of this, here's an image taken on a sunny day, firstly with the neutral filter. As you can see, the sun has blasted out the sky around it. Now, if you switch to the red filter, it's managed to control the strength of the sun in a much better way. And this is how I process the image into black and white, with a strong contrast boost. A quirky feature of the red filter is that the aperture blades sometimes appear as a star at the centre of the sun, as you can see here. This tends to be more pronounced with the red filter compared to the other filters. I'll show you some of my favourite black and white images taken with the red filter using a full-frame digital camera. I must say it's great fun taking the red raw images and processing them, and they can take quite a lot of pushing and pulling. While we scroll through these images, I should say a few words about the speed of the lens, as it's not that fast at f4, at least not fast by today's standards. For the vast majority of fisheye shots, this isn't really an issue. I find myself stopping down nearly all the time to get the best possible rendering. If you wanted to use the lens to take close-up objects that might be moving around a little, like insects or flowers in the wind, or if you wanted to try to get ultra-smooth bouquet, it would be useful to have a faster lens, but that's a very niche use of a fisheye. And then there are indoor shots that might benefit from a faster lens. However, it would be much better to use a tripod or a stable base in these situations. Having covered the filters and black and white images, what about colour rendering, aberrations, flares and sharpness? Starting with colour rendering, something that can be an issue with old lenses that don't produce particularly vibrant images. Well, in general, this is not a problem with this lens. Using the neutral filter, the colours produced by the lens are quite strong and bold, especially in good light. Straight out of camera, you can see the vibrancy of the colour rendering. It may not have the depth of modern digital lenses with advanced coatings, something I'll return to later, but still it's pretty good. Like many old lenses, it helps to process the images to get the best out of them. And unless otherwise stated, all the images in this video have been processed. I always find post-processing an enjoyable challenge, and different lenses require different kinds of adjustment. For this fisheye tachyma and colour images, I tend to play with the contrast and saturation. And I've also been using a bleach filter to bring out the details in the images, and give them a more dynamic look, as you can see here. In terms of chromatic aberrations and purple fringing, it's not a big issue, unlike some modern digital fisheyes, and again I'll return to this later. All I'd say for now is that if you took this image with some other lenses, you'd see an awful lot of purple fringing. Flares are a different matter because the lens is very prone to flares, or perhaps more accurately, it's prone to producing very strong flare shapes. We're not talking about light flares causing light patches on images. That's not really a problem with these coatings. But what you will see are these shapes. If you enjoy playing with these kinds of flares, then this is a very creative lens. They'll turn up regularly on sunny days, and you can use them to your advantage, moving them around the composition. Does it worry me? Well, not at all. It's just a fact of life with the lens that I happen to like. But if it worries you, it may not be the lens for you. And now onto sharpness. This is supposedly the Achilles heel of film era fisheyes on powerful modern sensors, especially full frame sensors, where the weakness around the edges of images are more apparent. Well, I can report that, and this probably won't be a surprise to you, that this old lens is not particularly sharp wide open at f4, although it sharpens up nicely in the center around f8 onwards. The obvious weakness of the lens, in common with other old lenses, is that the Takuma's images are quite soft towards the edges at all stops. 
especially compared to new fisheye lenses that have been digitally optimized. I've done some sharpness comparisons with a modern fisheye, which I'll show you later. But for now, here's just one example, where there is a clear drop-off in sharpness from the center. On a positive note, this and other images demonstrate that the lens is perfectly acceptably sharp towards the center. Indeed, it's very sharp in some cases, stopped down, when you nail the focus. The critical question, of course, is whether a sharp center and softer edges is acceptable for a fisheye lens. If you take ultra-wide lenses, then you do need across-the-frame sharpness. That's the point of the lenses, to show all the details of a scene across the frame. Unlike longer focal distances, like fast 50s, where you could argue that a softer edge actually helps to give greater subject isolation. However, for fish eyes, I think the answer is different. You're already getting a lot of distortion towards the edges, caused by the 180 degree point of view. And if these distorted parts are also quite soft, does this really distract from the overall image? I don't think it necessarily does. Indeed, a number of the most successful photos I posted online with the Takuma, successful measured by views and likes, have been relatively grainy and not sharp all over, if you choose to pixel peep. So I'd say that the interesting perspective caused by the fisheye effect is actually more important than edge-to-edge -edge sharpness. And if you want edge-to-edge -edge sharpness, then it's better to buy a top-quality new digital lens. One way, of course, to reduce problems at the edge of images is to use a crop sensor camera, because the sensor crops off the edges, leaving the sharper parts. The problem with this is that a crop sensor rather castrates the fisheye effect, and the Takuma 17mm becomes more of a conventional wide-angle lens. On a 1.5x crop sensor, it has a perspective that is more like a 25mm lens. There are two ways I can show you the impact of a crop sensor. Firstly, by taking a full-frame image and drawing the area that is covered by a crop sensor, in this case a 1.5x crop. I've also taken the same scene with the lens on a full-frame sensor and then a crop sensor, and you can see the real impact of using a crop sensor rather than a full-frame sensor. You get a strong image without the softer edges, but you don't get that strong fisheye perspective. In this regard, the fisheye becomes a neat walk-around lens on a crop sensor. But if you use it like this, is it any better than the lower end of a standard kit zoom? To find out, I've compared the fisheye on a crop sensor with a Sony kit lens at 17mm, also on a crop sensor. Having looked at the photos, there's not a huge difference in terms of the image perspective. As we've already seen, the fisheye effect has largely gone. This Sony kit lens isn't particularly highly regarded, and it's weaker towards the wider focal lengths, but it's certainly a lot cheaper to buy than the Takuma, and with autofocus and automated settings, it's a lot easier to use. On a straight head-to-head -head under controlled conditions, I'd say the Sony generally outperforms the kit lens in terms of sharpness across the frame and color contrasts, while the Takuma is capable of producing more vibrant images in the right conditions. This train station is always a good test of rendering, especially towards the edges, and I can secure the camera and lens on the bridge above the station. The Sony's image has been taken using auto exposure, while the Takuma has been manually controlled. Both lenses are stopped down. Zooming into the images, the differences in sharpness and details away from the center are obvious if you start pixel peeping. I'd only say that putting aside the pixel peeping, both images are okay as wide-angle shots, but they're nowhere near the best in class if you compare them with the best new lenses out there. Another noticeable difference in rendering between the old Takuma and the modern digital kit lens is how the lenses handle very bright light. The modern lenses' coatings clearly suppress more extreme light than the Takuma's neutral filter, as you can see from these two images. Especially this area of the image, the kit lens has handled the reflections on the cars quite well. In the same area, the Takuma flares the light quite strongly. You may or may not like this kind of effect, but the way the Takuma flares does lend itself to more creative photography, as I've already mentioned, and the images can look more vibrant. One other difference is the minimum focal distance. The fisheye can focus closer, and this also helps with creative photography. Although having said that, the kit lens can also focus quite close. In conclusion, the crop sensor lens does okay, and there's no particular reason to buy the Takuma. The fisheye lens is just not going to produce interesting enough fishy style images on a crop sensor. You'd have to go much wider than 17mm of that on crop. 
and up against a highly rated E-mount prime lens like the Sigma 16 f1.4, the Takuma would really struggle, except perhaps in its ability to produce flares. This brings us back to full frame sensors and the question of how this old film era lens performs against a modern fisheye lens optimized for digital sensors. Now the lens I'm going to use for this comparison is the Pentax DA 10-17 fisheye zoom. I'm using this lens because it's the only modern fisheye lens I have. It's actually a crop sensor lens, but at 17mm it works very well on full frame with no vignetting. The first thing to say about this modern lens is that it has a good reputation for its sharpness stop down and its coatings, which help considerably to cope with very strong light, and they help to produce very colourful images. It's a modified version of the Tokina 10 to 17 fisheye, which I notice appears in some lists of best fisheye lenses to buy in 2021. It doesn't have built in filters, and you can't attach a hood, but you can point the lens directly at the sun, and it'll do rather well. I should also admit at this juncture that I am a huge fan of this lens. I use it on both full frame and crop sensors. I always take it on trips and holidays, and it's never disappointed. It's like two types of lens in one, a fisheye at 10mm and an ultra-wide angle lens with much less distortion at 17mm. And it's encouraged me to be more creative in composing images. There's hardly a dull moment with this lens. Anyway, with that confession over, here's the view of the train station again, taken with the fisheye zoom at 17mm on full frame. And you can see the wider perspective from the full frame sensor, as well as a sharper rendering than the other lenses we've covered so far. Even stop right down, you can see another feature of this lens, which is rather more notorious, and that's purple fringing. And wider open, it's no exaggeration to say that this lens is a purple fringing monster, far worse than the Takuma. As soon as you realise this, you just have to adjust your compositions and deal with any fringing in post-processing. In all other respects, such as sharpness and rendering and flare control, the digital fisheye definitely outperforms the film era lens. And you would expect that, quite frankly. Optical and coating technologies have improved considerably since the early 1970s. Take these two images, which have a variety of detailed objects to compare, as well as the overall rendering, which to me simply looks crisper from the modern lens. And then if you zoom into, say, the car number plate on the left, the modern lens is a clear winner. I've examined many comparisons like this, and one thing I've noticed that is worth pointing out is the barrel distortion that the Takuma produces at the centre of images. It's a kind of ballooning effect at the centre, and it's not really obvious until you compare the Takuma and Pentax images side by side. In this street scene, I hope you can see what I mean if I quickly flick between the two images. It's perhaps more obvious in these two images, where the modern lens renders the greenhouse more accurately at the centre, i.e. the walls look flatter. Whereas for the Takuma, the walls that are facing us seem slightly bowed. And finally, we need to talk about prices, because the Takuma is not a cheap lens, at least not cheap relative to many other old M42 screw mount lenses. The modern digital zoom cost me more to buy new, around 50% more, but there are some well-rated digital prime fisheye lenses from third-party manufacturers that are not much more expensive than the Takuma, and some are cheaper. So I wouldn't say the Takuma, is particularly good value for money compared to some new digital fisheye primes, and it won't perform as well if you're after crisp digital images, and especially on crop sensors, where you really need a much wider perspective than 17 millimeters. On the other hand, the Takuma does have a number of advantages that you might feel are important. First of all, it has those built-in filters. Personally, I use the filters a lot more than I thought I would before I started using the lens. Secondly, you get those creative flares which are fun, and they don't appear nearly so often by design with the modern lens. Thirdly, the short minimum focal distance, which again can help to produce creative images if you like taking close-up fisheyes. And fourthly, speaking personally, I'm not sure I always like the crisp, high-definition digital images produced by modern lenses. Sometimes they look just too, how can I say this, too digital. So for certain types of images, I prefer the old-style, slightly grainy, slightly soft to the edges rendering of the Takuma. When I decided to buy the lens, I did so in a rather qualified manner. I wasn't expecting it to outperform modern lenses. The question was really one of how much the lens fell short of modern lenses. I mean, how bad would it be? So I give it a try and then sell it again if I didn't use it after testing. 
in the event I find I've been actively using the lens long after I finish the testing because it's so creative and the images, especially from the red filter, are so enjoyable to process. I won't take it on holiday in preference to the modern fisheye zoom because that lens is so easy to use and it offers a useful mix of fisheye and ultra wide angle views. However, the Takuma is definitely a keeper. I'd very much welcome any comments on this lens or the video in the comments section below. If you've enjoyed this and haven't already subscribed, please do, and I'll be posting some more reviews of old lenses.